Hey family, help me to reach 1000 subscribers. We are very close, let's continue the video. Today, many of us take advantage of cheap flights and public bus routes to ensure that we can travel wherever we need to go. Most of us feel safe in the knowledge that whenever we take public transport, be it bus, plane, or train, we are surrounded by crowds of people who will be witnesses to or step in should anything untoward happen to us. However, things haven't always been this way for British public transport. It wasn't until the late 1980s that train carriages without access to corridors began to be phased out from use. As trains were such a common way of traveling through the years, any crime that took place created mass hysteria and spread fear and doubt about how safe it really is to travel alone by the public transport system. In today's video, we'll be exploring just four murder cases that fueled such terror. Thursday, February 11, 1897 should have been a perfectly ordinary day for 33-year-old housekeeper Elizabeth Annie Cam. Elizabeth had gone to visit her elder sister in Houndsville that day, staying for approximately two hours and had done some shopping for her upcoming wedding before heading for the 7.42 p.m. train back to Waterloo. Elizabeth's fiancé, Edward Barry, a fruiterer, was waiting for her arrival at the other end of her journey. Barry was early for the 8.25 p.m. arrival of the train. As he waited on the platform and passengers began to alight, he scanned the crowds for his fiancée. When he couldn't locate her, he wondered if they'd missed each other and if she had gone outside to wait for him. About to turn away, Barry noticed a commotion some distance away. Police shortly accompanied a small group of railway workers. Curious and likely feeling a slight sense of panic, Barry approached the group to ask what had happened, only to be told that a carriage cleaner had seen the legs of a woman protruding from beneath the seat in a second-class carriage. The woman dead was partially concealed under the seat. The body was taken to St. Thomas Hospital, where Edward Barry formally identified it as his bride-to-be. It didn't take doctors long to establish a cause of death. Elizabeth's body had been repeatedly bashed and inside the carriage was a horrifying amount of blood. Superintendent Robinson of London South and Western Railway and Chief Inspector Marshall of Scotland Yard worked together to head the investigation. It was determined that there was no sexual assault and so investigators quickly ruled out that the murder was sexually motivated. However, they found that Elizabeth's pockets had been rifled through and that her purse with a small amount of money inside was missing, suggesting that the intended purpose was robbery. Elizabeth's train ticket, which she had when boarding, was also missing, although it's possible it was in her purse and was not taken intentionally. However, Elizabeth still wore her brooch and earrings, so it's unknown if the killer was simply in a panic or hurry or if there really was an ulterior motive and the scene was staged. Investigating officers recreated the circumstances of the crime and found that Elizabeth had likely fought back against her attacker. A well-built woman, fear spread when news broke out of the murder. As women wondered whether it was safe for them to travel alone by train. After all, if someone as formidable as Elizabeth Camp could be overpowered, then surely anyone else had very little chance. According to Elizabeth's sister, Porter, who helped her with her parcels, the carriage that she'd entered had been empty when she did so, meaning the killer had to have gotten on at some point during the other stops on a journey. The only clues found in the compartment were an umbrella later identified as Elizabeth's and a pair of bone cufflinks, although some sources say only one cufflink was recovered. As investigators searched the tracks for clues, they came across a large chemist pistol on an embankment between Putney and Onsworth. The pistol was stained with blood and hairs were attached to it. Doctors reported that this could have been the murder weapon given the limited capabilities of forensic science in 1897. However, no fingerprints or DNA traces could be lifted from the pistol. Police found there to be several suspects in the case of Elizabeth Camp. The landlord who owned the pub that she worked in denied any rumors that she had rejected him and a former fiancé was looked into but found to have a solid alibi. A lot of weight was placed in the fact that Elizabeth was lending money to friends and family members and her brother-in-law was investigated and asked to account for his movements on the night that she was murdered. The most compelling piece of evidence, however, came from a pastry chef who'd been a passenger on the train. Joining at Chiswick, the chef told police that Onsworth, a man, departed hurriedly. He was described as being of medium height and about 30 years old with a dark mustache, top hat, and a frock coat. 
Two porters on the train confirmed also seeing a man resembling the given description, but he was never traced. Ultimately, police couldn't connect any of their suspects with either the murder weapon or the train. An inquest ran for six weeks and the jury returned a verdict of willful murder by persons unknown. 122 years later, the murder of Elizabeth Annie Camp remains unsolved. On February 14, 1988, a Valentine's Day filled with endless joy, the energy of true love and excitement for the future, the happy couple of Harold and Aquila Degree got married. Two years later, on August 5, 1990, the husband and wife gave birth to a little girl, Asia. And soon, the couple became a family of four, adding a baby boy named O'Brien. The degrees stuck to their roots in Shelby, North Carolina, and blossomed as a close-knit family in their cozy residential home in the northern rural area west of Charlotte. Both Harold and Akila worked regular daytime jobs, making Asia and O'Brien latchkey kids once they reached the age to attend school. This youthful independence didn't bother the children, however, and their parents were 100% comfortable trusting Fulton Elementary School's efforts to return their son and daughter safely home. Asia, in particular, understood the security needed to navigate after-school loneliness and was wary of strangers even as a toddler. From kindergarten onwards, Harold and Akila knew their children would be at home completing homework or chores when they returned from their respective workplaces. While Asia's mind flourished in an educational environment, so did her interests and personality. Despite her academic and athletic duality, Asia was still quite reserved back at home. Her mother and father were suspicious of the world, especially the effects of new technology, specifically the internet, on young children's developing brains. The couple decided to focus on raising their son and daughter mostly around extended family, their church community, and local schools instead of an electronic atmosphere. As a byproduct of these methods, the degree household did not include a computer. Akila reasoned that, at the time, nightly news seemed to have daily stories about predators coaxing young minds via the internet. Nevertheless, Asia didn't mind the lack of technology, already cautious by nature and shy in bigger social climates. She was more than okay with settling within the parameters of her parents' close watch and never strayed far from good behavior. It was this simple, if not hyper-secure way of living that made Asia's disappearance that much more puzzling. She showed zero signs of disturbance or inclination to up and leave. Her intensity of focus led her parents to believe she didn't even like leaving the house in general when it could be avoided. Regardless, when Harold and Akila woke up to celebrate their 12th year anniversary in marriage, the joy, love, and excitement from 1983 were replaced with trepidation, mystery, and helpless terror. On Valentine's Day 2000, Asia Degree vanished. The mystery begins on February 11, 2000. It's a Friday and the Degree siblings Asia and O'Brien had the day off from school. They go to their Aunt Keisha's house just down the street in their home neighborhood and later to their respective basketball practices. The following day, on Saturday, February 12, Asia and her youth basketball team suffer their first loss of the season. The loss upsets Asia and her friends, who walk around the court faking injuries before a fellow teammate asks them to stop. Asia eventually comes around and understands the situation, reverting back to her normal self later in the day. In the evening, Asia sleeps over at her cousin's slumber party where the girls watch television late into the night. On Sunday, February 13th, Harold and Akila Degree pick up their daughter and the family attends church. Immediately following, they go to the residence of another cousin, Shalanda Brown, where Asia's grandmother gifts her cologne and candy. Exhausted from the slumber party, Asia returns home and goes to bed at 6.30 p.m. Her rest is disturbed a couple of hours later when a gusty thunderstorm hits the Shelby area. Asia heads to the living room to watch television with her parents. At around 9 p.m., a motorcycle crash in the neighborhood takes down power lines, causing the Degree household to lose electricity. Akila decides to wait for the children's bath until the morning and sends Asia and O'Brien to bed early. About two hours later, at 11 p.m., Harold Degree runs out to the store to get some last-second gifts for his wife, excited to celebrate their 12th anniversary as a married couple. After the clock strikes midnight and Valentine's Day begins, the power is restored at about 12.30 a.m. Akila wakes her husband up, who sleeps on the couch, and tells him to move the kerosene lamp. 
Harold can't go back to sleep and watches more TV, later checking on Asia and O'Brien, who were both soundly asleep in their beds at 2.30 a.m. Sometime in the very early a.m. hours, O'Brien Degree wakes up and hears his sister stirring in bed. At one point, hearing her climb out of bed and walk to the bathroom. It is unconfirmed whether or not he heard Asia return. Between this moment and 4 a.m. on February 13, 2000, Asia grabs her backpack stuffed with clothes and sneaks out of her room, her family none the wiser. At 5.45 a.m., Akila awakens to get her children up and ready for Monday morning classes. However, when she checks the kids' bedroom, she finds O'Brien still asleep and Asia's bed empty. She soon finds the rest of the house void of her daughter's presence and restlessly searches the nooks and crannies of their home. Harold soon joins the immediate search and when they find Asia's set of house keys are also missing, they call her grandmother who lives across the street. The grandmother informs them that she never saw or heard from Asia. Harold and Akila are left to walk up and down the street, screaming their daughter's name, desperate and afraid. When no trace can be found in the first hour of their search, the degree couple calls the police at 6.39 a.m. Authorities show no hesitation and arrive on the scene promptly. They comb the neighborhood, find zero clues, and aside from the situation being bigger than originally thought, the sheriff's office calls in search and rescue ops, special detectives, and the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations. At 2 p.m., the degree residence is taped off by state investigators who find no signs of forced entry, forced exit, or foul play from anywhere inside the home. Through the search of Asia's bed and belongings with the help of Akila's familiar recognition, they build an inventory of Asia's missing items that she most likely brought with her. This consists of a red vest, blue jeans with a red stripe, a white shirt, a black and white shirt, black overalls with a Tweety Bird image, a black Tweety Bird pocketbook, candy, and her house keys. Later that afternoon, two truck drivers come forward with a story about potential Asia sightings from earlier that morning. The first man, Jeff R., states he saw a little girl walking along North Carolina Highway 18 in a downpour at approximately 3.30 a.m. His location was just over a mile south from Asia's house. The second man, retired sheriff's deputy Roy B., along with his son, saw what they first thought to be a short stature woman at 4.15 a.m. walking down Highway 18 just before the Highway 180 intersection. This was also about a mile south of Asia's house. Royce sent out an alert to fellow truck drivers to keep their eyes open. After he circled back a few times to get a better glimpse of the wandering figure, she ran off the road and into the nearby woods. This would be the last known, though unconfirmed, sighting of Asia degree. After Jeff and Roy came forward with their leads, investigators set up a five-mile radius search in the woods near Highway 18 and Highway 180. Unfortunately, the weather takes away the bloodhound's abilities to pick up any scent and the modified search turns up nothing. When the sun goes down that Valentine's Day, Harold and Akila are interviewed by the State Bureau. They are quickly ruled out as suspects and fully cooperate with the police. The first major clue in the case comes the following day on February 15th. A volunteer search team asks Shelby citizens Rayleigh and Debbie Turner if they can check their property for signs of Asia, considering their property was a mile south of the degrees and somewhat close to the highway sighting marks. The Turner couple happily obliges and opens their door structure in their backyard where old furniture was stored. In it, they discover candy wrappers, a green marker, a 1996 Atlanta Olympics pencil, and a small photograph of a young girl who looks very much like Asia. These items are classified as evidence and thought to be artifacts from Asia's backpack she took with her. Another day passes before police arrive on the scene at the Turners on February 16th. They hand over the little photograph but theorize the house is too far for Asia to stumble upon. Another one of their neighbors, Reverend Mackie Turner, says that his beagles usually barked whenever a stranger approached his home but they were quiet on Valentine's morning. On February 17th, investigators find more candy wrappers around the Turner residence and the couple turns over the rest of their findings. Police then interview other families of the girls on Asia's basketball team and confirm the candy wrappers matched the candy handed out to the players from Asia's basketball game that previous Saturday. 
However, none of the degree family members nor Fulton Elementary School students recognized the young girl in the watched photograph and it's decided that while related to the investigation, the photo is not that of Asia degree. After three more days of exhaustive searches, authorities scale back the hunt and end the official search on February 20, 2000. In a twofold act, a part of law enforcement investigation, March 22, produced the next two updates. First, supporters are acting missing persons billboard at the exact spot the truck driver saw Asia run into the woods off Highway 18. Second, police announced they've interrogated a bevy of potential suspects, ranging from degree family friends to sex offenders in the area. During these interviews, the authorities build a psychological profile of a possible abductor but never release it to the public in hopes of protecting Asia. The next major clue is unearthed by grading contractor Terry Fleming. On August 2, 2001, a year and a half since Asia vanished. He is etching the driveway on the side of a hill. On his tractor, he hits a clunky object covered with dark plastic. He cracks it open and finds a black book bag inside with an unknown name and address. Without cell service but with an unsettling feeling, Terry cannot contact anyone but writes the information down. The morning after, on August 3rd, Terry gives the name and address to his wife, who recognizes the info and tells Terry to call the police because the credentials belong to Asia's degree. Officials arrive on the scene and discover the book bag had been wrapped in two trash bags. And intentionally buried long before the unearthing, the Bureau would not directly identify what exactly is in the book bag, but says it's 95% Asia's possessions and the Charlotte's Observer reports the contents included clothes and school supplies. A new search is soon put forth on August 15th, but the terrible conditions of both the terrain and weather make it almost unbearable. The three-mile-long dig turns up little outside of some animal skeletons and a pair of man's khaki pants. Items neither confirmed nor denied to have a relation to Asia's case. Another massive search goes underway in October of 2001, this time combing a six-mile stretch down Highway 18. It would later be the first portion of a lengthy 26-mile-long trail of sleuthing. From Asia's home to the book bag excavation site and still turn up no clues. Over the next decade or so, authorities interview countless suspects nearby criminals, surging endlessly across North Carolina and the lands linked to Asia and her family's past. In May 2016, investigators say they're looking for a dark green 1970s Ford Thunderbird or Lincoln Mark IV with rusty wheel wells. How or why the car connects to Asia is unknown, but still a current major point of interest. Biggest clues of all, however, pop up later in October of 2018, investigators from the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office release a video pinpointing two major pieces of evidence they're seeking information about. Giving zero context or details, but claiming these items have advanced the meticulous search for Asia's degree. Because of how tightly wound the entire investigation has been kept, vital pieces of evidence are hard to signify. Important only by the word of police through the funneling of local media. Thus, the most important case point can only be the most recent. Providing a fresh chance for someone to come forward with a lead that could solve the mystery. The following is the exact the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office released last October in 2018, pleading for public knowledge regarding two clues surfaced in the search. Listen closely, especially if you or anyone you know is familiar with the greater Shelby, North Carolina area. While the background a doctor, Zeus's book and t-shirt is unknown, the ambiguity still holds weight for the case. They can most certainly be connected, but they can also be wholly separate from one another. So even if you only know something about one half of the equation, do not hesitate to shed light on these peculiar subjects. Early on in the case, many Shelby residents and interested onlookers pondered if Asia woke up in the middle of the night and decided to leave and announce on her own authority. Many of these supporters couldn't get past the situation of a packed book bag with so much clothing and candy. It certainly seems as if Asia was planning for a nine-year-old's idea of an adventure making sure she had her favorite outfits and plenty of candy to provide the sugar and energy necessary for an imaginative quest. What was missing from the theory was any clear motive and sensible reasoning to explain a single-digit aged girl leaving a simple, sufficient life. While Asia had more of a sheltered childhood, she loved the friendly conclusion and was still able to maintain a healthy social life in extracurricular activities at school. 
She was close with her family both in personal relationships and geographic proximity, and obviously found tight-knit friendships in her cousins and fellow peers on her basketball team. There were no reports of youthful rivalries or bullying, and Harold and Akila provided everything their children needed. Thus, if Asia did leave as a runaway child, it was for a completely unexpected, unexplainable reason. Maybe she had a goal only she was aware of as the result of a creative young mind, or maybe it was the result of an unknown sinister encounter she had the previous weekend. Maybe she made innocent plans to meet a friend or even a stray for Valentine's Day engagement and packed the only way she knew how, instructed to leave before dawn at the ignorance of her parents and brother. It's a hard theory to swallow considering the complete lack of supporting evidence and the facts that Asia had little connection to anyone outside of her controlled circle. The idea of a potential kidnapping spawned whispered speculation about Asia's disappearance as well. Obviously, police ruled it out right away after a few detailed inspections of the degree children's bedroom and exit routes proved foul play was a non-factor. Of course, there's always a possibility that an abductor was stealthy enough to get in and out careful not to leave fingerprints or any trail behind. Or as a few corners of the internet like to hypothesize, the culprit came from within the household placing suspicion on Harold Degree himself. The theory is based on the fact that Harold was the last person to see his daughter, spent most of the evening away from his wife on the couch, and made an unscheduled trip to the grocery store late at night. However, the circumstantial facts and their Aisha's father and entire family for that matter have denied any such rumors or conspiracies. They point to Harold's underlying love for a parent or throughout her young life. He, along with Akila, has spent hundreds of dollars, thousands of hours, and never-ending energy looking for their precious daughter. He has cooperated with police investigations and was ruled out by the authorities early on and for what it's worth passed polygraph tests. While it's easy to point fingers at physical people with faces we can see, it's more than likely a figure yet to be identified who took Asia's life into their own hands. Still keeping an abductor theory in mind, some internet sleuthers wonder if a serial killer was involved. North Carolina has had its share of murderous minds, such as the Edgecombe County serial killer. But very few line up the insidious activity with a timeline of Asia's disappearance. The one interesting possibility is Scott Williams, a serial killer who murdered three women spanning 10 years in 1997, 2004, and 2006. The homicides took place near Monroe, North Carolina, only a couple of counties over from Cleveland County and the degree's hometown of Shelby. Scott Williams' whereabouts in late 1999 are unknown. However, he was also charged with kidnapping and rape against two other women in 1995 and, most interestingly, in 2000. Yet considering all of the potential in Scott's history and criminal incarnations, his modus operandi doesn't match Asia's profile. Scott mostly preyed upon middle-aged white women and had no prior incidents with young African-American girls. Also, because he was entering into the criminal database of the United States Justice Department, his DNA and fingerprints would be available to match if the investigators on Asia's case discussed either type of evidence in their hunt for answers. It's more than likely Scott Williams is a circumstantial suspect holding little weight in the lineup of theoretical suspects. In terms of other possible serial killers or murderers, the sad fact of the matter is many cases involving African-American children, teenagers, and women are left unsolved, unaccounted for, and kept out of the media. Thus evaluating patterns and creating a database for killers with similar profiled victims doesn't exist, leaving the world to ponder if there was indeed a serialized string of kidnapped black females in the Carolinas at the turn of the millennia left in the mud and forgotten, all worse ignored. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Asia's unsolved disappearance, we want to make known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In regards to the nine-year-old girl who vanished without a trace on Valentine's Day of 2000, we believe an explanation derives as a combination of the theories discussed in the previous segment. The seemingly intentional packing of a book bag needs us to figure Asia did indeed leave the household on her own. Why? 
It's nearly impossible to fathom whether or not someone asked her to leave is too vague of an assumption to try and hone in on the details, but still a curious speculation. Then sometime after leaving her house, Asia lost herself along the North Carolina highways and wandered into the woods, meandering without a call or comfort and some arriving on the candy she packed. Somewhere along the way, she probably ran into something sinister, or rather someone sinister ran into her. It's at this point, Asia's trail goes cold, most likely taken against her will in the clutches of unidentified shadows. There are zero signs pointing to either life or death, but with resounding optimism, there is a chance Asia's heart beats just the same as it did 19 years ago in the end. The stronger conclusions rest within the clues presented by detectives in October of 2018, the Dr. Zeus's children's book, Mac Elliott's Pool, and the concert t-shirt for the pop band New Kids on the Block. There's a good possibility that either of these items was found in Asia's book back recovered in August of 2001. That these items were confirmed to be in the Degrees household when Aisha went missing but disappeared afterward. All these items were separately and tested positive with Asia's DNA. We believe Asia's DNA was in fact found on the book as well as other sets of unidentified DNA. Asking people to come forward who may have checked the book out from the library or known someone to have touched it at some point would help investigators inquire about further DNA testing. The same can be hypothesized with the shirt. In a similar scenario, the sheriff's deputy might not actually have the shirt in evidence but have proof that Asia owned one at the time of her disappearance and finding one out in the public could bring a new suspect and find new leads via testimony or DNA data. In conjunction with the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office and their newly presented clues, we plead for anyone with a connection to the book or the shirt to come forward with information. Even if it seems trivial, nonsensical, or completely unrelated to Asia's case, you never know when the key will come from within the cracks. The Degree family is certain Asia is still alive out there in the world and is hopeful to learn of her fate in their own lifetimes. With the help of a wider audience, Harl and Akila can find a growing optimism in their 19-year-old wish, a wish to reunite with their bubbling daughter, her wish to find the spark of delight in their lives that was Asia Degree. So passionate about her friends and her family and growing as an individual. A wish to give their missing child the potential she had so many years ago to experience a full life completed with hopes and dreams successes in trials, lessons, and laughter and love. And regardless of how it's achieved, let's shed some light on Asia Degree's mystery and make sure that next Valentine's Day Harold and Akila return the days where the anniversary was defined by joy and excitement. A day full of family bonding, a February 14th void of confusion and sponsored by Closure. Born October 30, 1840, in France, Mueller was a German tailor now renowned for committing the initial murder on a British train. In 1864, Mueller's victim was Thomas Briggs, a 69-year-old banker who left behind a wife and daughter upon his demise. On July 9, 1864, Briggs was beaten into unconsciousness and robbed while traveling on the 9.50 p.m. North London Railway train from Fenchurch Street to Chalk Farm. At 10.11 p.m., two bank clerks entered the carriage and discovered a pool of blood, alerting the train guard. Ten minutes later, a train driver going in the opposite direction spotted Briggs's body on an embankment between Old Bow and Hackney Wicks Station. Thomas Briggs had been thrown from the train, missing his gold eyeglasses, gold watch, and gold chain, although five pounds remained in his pocket. Despite being rushed to a public house for medical attention, Briggs succumbed to his wounds the following night having suffered multiple head lacerations and a skull fracture. Inside the cabin Briggs occupied was a blood-covered walking cane, leading investigators to speculate on whether it was the murder weapon. Additionally, his bag was found, along with a black beaver had initially thought to be the victim's but later determined to belong to the killer. On July 18th, cab driver Matthews raised suspicions about Franz Mueller, who had previously been engaged to Matthews's eldest daughter. Mueller had visited with a gold chain in a box, attaching the chain to his own watch. Matthews noticed the box was from a jeweler in Cheapside, prompting authorities to investigate John Death's shop. Death confirmed Mueller's visit on July 11th, providing a photo obtained from Matthews, revealing Mueller exchanged a gold chain for a cheaper one and a ring. Matthews also confirmed the beaver had belonged to Mueller, stating he bought it for him. 
With an arrest warrant issued, authorities went to Mueller's home where his landlady confirmed the hat's ownership. She mentioned Mueller left on July 14th, acting non-suspicious upon returning the night of the 9th with no blood on his clothes when she washed them. Investigators discovered Mueller boarded a ship to New York following suit on July 20th. Upon Mueller's arrival on August 25th, he was arrested Briggs's gold watch and hat found on him. Mueller had altered the latter in an attempt to disguise himself. Extradited to the UK, Mueller stood trial maintaining his innocence and claiming he was elsewhere during the murder, including at a brothel. Despite defense witnesses claiming Mueller obtained the items from a man at the docks, the jury found him guilty of murder in just 15 minutes on October 29th, publicly hanged outside Newgate Prison in London on November 14th. Mueller reportedly admitted his guilt to a German-speaking pastor moments before the execution. This hanging marked one of the last public executions in England with 50,000 spectators in attendance. While Briggs's murder was undoubtedly horrific, it prompted safety improvements in railway travel, such as the implementation of communication cords in all trains and the creation of carriages with corridors. On the 3.25 p.m. South Anton to Reading train on Monday, June 20, 1964, a 12-year-old boy went to the toilet only to witness the gruesome and terrifying sight of the murdered teenager. Frightened, the boy ran off screaming, alerting a passenger who promptly pulled the communication cord just as the train was leaving Basingstoke. The victim, 15-year-old Yvonne Lake, was on her way back to boarding school having boarded at Southampton. Her father, an RAF serviceman stationed in Singapore, and Yvonne had been staying with her grandparents over the weekend. They were the ones to formally identify her body. Yvonne's blue hodel was found in the middle of the train, while her shoes and Barrett were discovered the following day along the track, 10 miles south of Basingstoke. Yvonne hadn't been sexually assaulted, but she had been brutally attacked on the back of the head with a glass bottle, and her throat was cut with its broken remains. Glass shards and copious amounts of blood littered the crime scene. Investigators suspected the murder occurred just after Winchester, one of the seven stops on the journey when the train was nearly empty. The only clue found in Yvonne's case was a brown paper bag with a reinforced bottom, similar to one a wine merchant would carry. Inside was a greaseproof bread wrapper for biscuits and a tin manufactured by Marks and Spencer. Despite police attempts to identify the owner, no one came forward, leading to the suspicion that it belonged to the murderer. During the investigation, 40 out of 60 passengers promptly came forward and were subsequently cleared. The only suspect in Yvonne's death was a 27-year-old married father of three who had been arrested for motoring charges and mentioned being on the train at the time of the murder. Green glass matching that from the crime scene was found in the pockets of the unidentified man, but he claimed not to know how it got there. Accounting for his movements of the day, the man stated that he had gone to Basingstoke Labor Exchange and then a pub in Church Street. He boarded the wrong train, intending to go to a Royal Marines recruitment office in Winchester but ended up on the Reading Brown service instead. The man was brought to trial on November 23, 1964, where a reporter said the defendant had gotten into the same compartment as Yvonne. The defendant maintained that another man committed the crime, describing him as 5'9", wearing a sports jacket, white shirt, and tie. According to the defendant, he witnessed the man steadying Yvonne with an arm around her shoulder, inquiring about her well-being. The defendant claimed the man said she was being sick. He did not see them together after that but did see the man emerge from the toilet alone. When the defendant offered help, he was told to mind his own business. Several witnesses confirmed seeing a man matching the defendant's description and one even claimed the man on trial was not the same person they had seen. More than six hours later, the jury acquitted the defendant of the murder. However, he had allegedly committed arson and was later jailed for 18 months in relation to one barn and the furniture. No other suspects were identified and the details of what truly transpired on the day Yvonne Lake was murdered remain unknown. Her case remains unsolved. Brian Dylan Ninsfield, just 18 years old in January of 1997, was a freshman at Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island. Described as quiet with few friends, Brian chose Roger Williams University due to its home-like atmosphere, especially after enduring his parents' divorce. 
Despite homesickness during his architecture course, he enjoyed reading and listening to music by the water beneath Mount Hope Bridge. Struggling somewhat to keep up with his studies, Brian's life took a distressing turn on January 31st when he received a phone call from a former Roger Williams University student who threatened him and claimed he could still access the campus. Around 12.30 a.m., Brian called his father, urging him to come down to the university. In turn, his father advised him to contact campus security, whose only recommendation was to change his phone number. A week later, on February 6th, Brian finished his literature class and vanished. His parents were not alerted until February 12th, finding his room undisturbed but his mother, Marianne. Discovering a mysterious call from a woman associated with the school who alleged that staff members were withholding information about Brian and the case. Unfortunately, the line went dead and the caller remains unidentified. Six months later, on Labor Day weekend in September, a mother and daughter discovered a shoe on Hog Island Beach containing part of a foot, later identified as Brian's through DNA analysis. No other remains were found and Brian was presumed dead upon this gruesome discovery. The man behind the threatening phone calls, identified as former student Josh Cohen, admitted to making the calls but claimed they were in jest. Authorities do not believe Cohen is involved in Brian's disappearance. Several theories surround the case, including the possibility that Brian accidentally fell into the river beneath Mount Hope Bridge or that he jumped from the bridge. Brian's parents, blaming the university for not notifying them promptly, sued Roger Williams University, pushing for a national law requiring faster parental notification in missing person cases. The university's attitude reportedly instructing tour guides to claim Brian was safe at home and discouraging information sharing raised concerns about the handling of Brian's disappearance. Unfortunately, little was done in relation to the case and without further action, Brian's disappearance may remain unsolved. 19 years old at the time of her disappearance and subsequent death, Teresa Allor was staying at Champlain College in Lenoxville, Quebec, Canada, described as a clever and well-rounded girl. On Friday, November 3, 1978, Teresa had plans to study and work on a book report for her college course, making arrangements to meet friends around 9 p.m. However, she never showed up and when reported missing, police initially dismissed it as a simple runaway. Her body was found on April 13, 1979, by a muscat trapper six months after she was reported missing. Teresa's jewelry, watch, and clothing were still on her body when located in Compton, a small body of water about one kilometer from her dormitory residence. Signs of strangulation were reported by the on-scene coroner, but a cause of death could not be established. Police assumed it was drug-related, possibly an overdose, speculating that fellow college students had panicked and dumped her body instead of seeking help, despite no drugs being found in her system. Little investigation was done into Teresa's case and her clothing was destroyed five years after her body was discovered. In the summer of 2002, Teresa's family enlisted the help of a friend and investigative reporter who presented evidence suggesting Teresa was murdered and refuting the accidental overdose theory. The journalist also highlighted possible links to two unsolved cases in Quebec, Manon Dub, a 10-year-old who went missing in March 1978, and Louise Cameron, missing in March 1977. Both cases involved mysterious circumstances and remain unsolved. An FBI consultant suggested a connection between the three cases indicating a serial sexual predator in the Quebec area during the 70s. In 2004, Quebec's cold case unit was created and in 2019, Montreal followed suit, but there have been no new leads in any of the cases. Teresa's brother John, a strong advocate for justice in Teresa's case and the other possibly linked cases, has researched extensively and found common elements in many unsolved cases from the 70s, including signs of strangulation, sexual assault, nudity or semi-nudity, and the involvement of a vehicle. The only brief suspect in Teresa's case was the man in charge of the student's residence, who disappeared shortly after the murder. The residence was then closed down by the college, but the man was never questioned or identified and his absence remains unexplained. Teresa Allor's case remains unsolved. Born Betsy Ruth Artsmare on July 11, 1947, in Holland, Michigan, the 22-year-old student's life was tragically cut short. 
Betsy, one of four children in her family, initially studied English and art at the University of Michigan before enrolling at Pennsylvania State University after graduating. Her long-term boyfriend, David Wright, was a medical school student at the same university and they had plans to marry. On November 28, 1969, Betsy was in the library doing research for a paper when she was found collapsed on the floor by fellow students. Initially thought to have suffered a seizure or passed out, it was later discovered that she had been stabbed once through the left breast. Betsy was wearing a red dress that concealed the blood and she bled out into her lungs, leaving little blood around the wound. Police investigated the murder, holding 5,000 interviews but making no arrests and identifying few suspects. David Wright, initially considered a person of interest, was quickly ruled out due to his solid alibi and a good relationship with Betsy. Witnesses reported hearing a scream or the sound of falling books or shelves and drawings of possible witnesses were released but proved too generic. The murder weapon was never recovered and the crime scene had been cleaned up by a janitor, leaving little evidence for investigators. Several suspects were considered, including an English professor named Robert Durgey, who was later cleared. The infamous Ted Bundy was briefly speculated to be involved, but he was ruled out. Another suspect was a military man, theorized to be involved in a gay encounter. One significant suspect was Richard Hefner, who had dated Betsy briefly. He went to his professor's home hours after the murder, claiming he didn't know about it until the day after, but he was never further investigated. Hefner later faced legal issues for molesting a 13-year-old boy and assaulting a woman in a parking lot. Many online spectators and true crime authors believe Hefner was responsible for Betsy's murder, but the case remains unsolved 50 years later.